Wayne, why don't you take it away? Okay. We can just go to the first slide, Courtney. Thank you so much. The statement above is attributed to Dickens. I don't know if anyone has a specific source. I couldn't find it easily. It's somewhere in his correspondence, maybe. But I thought this was a good example of making him wait. The illustration here is the stoppage at the fountain, which doesn't occur until chapter seven, book two, chapter seven. So I, I'm going to have to go back a little bit, but I used to point out to young students, for many people, this is the instigating event in the plot. And we've waited a long time for it. So I'm wondering if any of you would like to weigh on on whether Dickens almost takes too long to get the plot rolling, as it does here. Go ahead and unmute yourselves if you'd like to contribute. Yeah. Uh, may I may I comment? Sure. Sure. Okay. Uh, I think he does it just beautifully because there's a section toward the end of chapter 15 where Defarge is uh, talking about the man with the blue cap and how the man with the blue cap is such a royalist and, and cheering on the monarchy. And he says Good. to Defarge, you're the fellow we want. You make these fools believe that it will last forever. And the more insolent they'll be, and then the nearer will come. And it just reminded me in reading this about Lenin saying about the Russian revolution, the worse, the better. And I thought Dickens just beautifully captured that. I think some of the leaders of the French Revolution might agree with that statement. Uh, Marat and uh, Saint-Just, apparently. But uh, there was some discussion uh, last time about the trial of Charles Darney. And in this case, the child being run over is based on an actual incident, at least one actual incident. And as Dickens mentions in this chapter, sometimes the coach didn't even stop. <laughs> it was hit and run. Let's see, can I get that? Yeah. I wanted to point out too, of course, the stoppage at the fountain is part of the extensive water imagery in A Tale of Two Cities. We'll see more of that, of course. And I wanted to point out just a little bit about the scene. You can see the Marquis looking down from his carriage and Ernest Defarge is restraining Gaspar. And uh, I'm not sure whether that's supposed to be Madame Defarge there on the right. Looks like she's knitting even here. But here, Fizz is very accurate because you'll see that Ernest Defarge is wearing culotte or knee breeches and hose. Whereas Gaspar is wearing what we would call trousers and wooden shoes. So this was a marked, uh, marks the difference in class between laboring class and 
say the tavern owner, owner uh, middle class. So this begins what I would characterize as the huge pendulum swing in the tale of two cities. That is, at this point, we start to, or are meant to revile the aristocracy, or at least some of them. Although Dickens knew his history, I think, he points out that not all of them were as cruel as the Marquis Saint Evermont. And many of them actually did want reform. But as you know, by the third part of the novel, the pendulum is going to swing in the other direction. And we sympathize with the victims of the terror, particularly, and begin to think the revolution has become brutal. Okay, I guess we can go to oh. another slide. Go ahead. Uh, Wayne, Wayne, yes. can I make a comment? Sure. Um, going Karen. back to your uh, going back to your original question about Good. whether Dickens waited too long to introduce this, I yes. was reading the chapter um, about Tale of Two Cities in the Oxford Handbook of Charles Dickens, 2018. Great. You know, yes, that's yes. edited by our own John Jordan and uh, Patton. Yeah and Catherine Waters. And the author of that chapter made the point that Dickens uses a triple temporality of historical time in this novel. Mm -hmm. And I found that interesting and it sort of goes along with what you're saying. She makes the point that one of those three is a very slow geographical evolution of time. Um, a second portion of time that he uses is a bit, a quicker pace of social history, uh, like the French and the English. And an even, then thirdly, an even faster momentum of event-driven history. And I think this point and the slide you showed us first is an event-driven example of history. And I, if, you, if we look at the novel in total, from those three temporalities of historical time, I think where he introduces this is pretty much right on target in my view anyway. Found that interesting. The other thing from this um, handbook chapter that goes back to last week's discussion, one of the participants was saying how his French uh, side sort of rebelled at the non-subtle way in which Dickens portrays uh, the, the, yes. the reign of terror in the French Revolution. And the author of this chapter alludes to the fact that this book is certainly not the most popular book uh, or novel in France. And that goes along with what we were saying. And French translators, in fact, were known to underplay or tone down some of the most gruesome and terrifying episodes to make it a bit more palatable to the French. It was very, it's a great chapter for those of you who have this handbook to, to really look at. Um, the author is in fact French, but she teaches English literature. And in that, they make, this is kind of just a funny little vignette, but Apparently, Margaret Thatcher made a terrible political and diplomatic faux pas in that she was attending the um, bicentenary of the revolution in 1989, and she actually gave Francois Mitterrand a copy of A Tale of Two Cities. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and he was rather aghast, I guess. <laughs> and I think, again, that goes back to last week's, uh, last month's discussion, where the point was raised that if we look at this novel in light of the French psyche, memory and trauma of it, it's very, very different than how the English would have perceived it, so. Well, this may be just coincidental, but the first time I went to Paris, there was a huge protest going on at the Gaulle airport. And uh, a good number of people, I think they were complaining about the low wages at that time. 
but I think maybe the, on my second trip, there was a very different protest in the Paris streets. The motorcycles had been banned from the sidewalks. I think you could still ride your motorcycle in the streets. So in areas of Paris, the streets were entirely full of motorcycles, motorcyclists <laughs> protesting this new regulation. But anyway, <laughs> I think they like their revolution much more than we do. Well, we can go on to the next slide, Courtney. Beautiful. Uh, now you're wondering what on earth? <laughs> Does anyone recognize these images? There's a hint. One of them. <laughs> it must be Beatlemania. Yeah, Beatlemania, absolutely. <laughs> You're not in one of these pictures, are you, Courtney? <laughs> I don't think so. No. <laughs> uh, I think this is on their first tour in 1964. Someone asked, one of the fans, everyone's screaming, how, how do you hear the performance? And she said, oh no, we listen to records to hear the music <laughs> we don't we don't expect to hear it at the performance the the school i was teaching in in chicago when they first performed in 1964 we stopped school while they were performing and put it on the loud sleep speaker nice nice <laughs> I actually thought this would be a way to start thinking about crowd dynamics and uh, the way that crowds are organized. Because there's no doubt in this case, the most of the audience was giving vent to pent up feelings, shall we say. And I've forgotten who commented that we don't see this nowadays because possibly girls especially are less repressed. <laughs> I hope to think that's true. Yeah. <laughs> but what seems to happen in a crowd is a result of the people reacting to each other more than to a leader. The leader may serve kind of as a figurehead, in this case, the, the rock group, the Beatles, and a focus point. I think Freud also maintained that the leader of a crowd hypnotizes, or the crowd allows itself to be hypnotized by the leader. I don't know if that's always true. But if I'm correct that the, the members of the crowd are really participating with each other, then this is what uh, Foucault would have called disciplinary power. And that's a misleading term because he means the the power that we exert over each other or as participants in something. And so it, it runs horizontally rather, rather than from the top down. And I think Dickens was very interested in the way that crowds form and how they can become extremely overwrought It's just one anecdote, the uh, more radical revolutionaries sometimes deployed the Paris mob to intimidate the General Assembly. But a day came, I guess, after the terror when 
they decided to call out the mob and guess what? Nobody showed up. And it turned out that all the precinct leaders and organizers had been guillotined. So there was no one to sort of call out the, the, the crowd. Let's see, I guess we can go to another slide, Courtney. So there are two questions, um, Phyllis and then oh, David. sorry, didn't see that. Yes, um, don't have my hi. box open. Hi, Phyllis. Uh, hey, how are you? This is great, Doing thank well. you so you much. Are. Yes, I am. Um, I'm so glad you started talking about crowds because um, especially what we were just talking about, the different um, views of the revolution, I just thought Dickens was in the Honest Tradesman chapter where the uh, mob attacks the uh, funeral procession of the spy. Um, yes. He's getting at least to say, it's not just the French that do this. Um, and he, you're right, he is actually a, almost a very dispassionate, I mean, he was a reporter, you know, talking about uh, you make a transition the, from the sport of window breaking and thence to the plundering of the public houses. It's easy and natural. At last, after several hours, when sundry summer houses had been pulled down and some area railings had been torn up to arm the more belligerent spirits, a rumor got about that the guards were coming. Before this yes. rumor, the crowd gradually melted away and perhaps the guards came and perhaps they never came. Mm -hmm. And this was the usual progress of a mob. Um, so usual progress, there were mobs, right? I mean, in Barnaby Rudge, he has just incredible crowd scenes. And in fact, I would love to sort of do a, a parallel study of Barnaby Rudge and A Tale of Two Cities at some point because- um, Oh, yes. That's yes, uh, absolutely. That's a really. That's when England turned on itself, right? It really was um, English people killing other English people and pulling them out of their houses, and because they were Catholics. I mean, it was a very. Um, but he has a great descriptions of mob. So anyway, I just thought it was really fun to see that he's kind of giving a little equal opportunity mobism <laughs> for a bit, just so that. Yes, when last week's reading, the crowd in the courtroom. The old yes. Bailey yes. is compared repeatedly to flies. Yes, I love the buzzing the flies. of the crowd is the buzzing yes. of flies. Right. So, and then the buzzing of flies around the dead bodies, the new flies. Yes. Yes. No, uh, I love the narrator that. calls it ogreish. Yes. So it's an indication that at least sometimes Dickens saw the downside of a nice English mob <laughs> or English group. <laughs> And see, David, you had a point? Yes. Uh, I don't know how many people here have ever been part of a mob. I have, it was a student, it was a student mob, a sort of spring riot. And it was very interesting to me because you have a strong sense of power without responsibility. Yes. It's exhilarating. Yes. yes. Well, David, were you arrested? There were too many of us. Oh, okay. <laughs> we were, we had traffic uh, stopped on Massachusetts Avenue and people were rocking the cars with lots oh of goodness. alarm from their passengers and drivers. And it was all very much, uh, it was not planned. And the, crowd, the mob as a whole worked very impulsively. If somebody said, let's go to the president's house. Yes, right. Mm -hmm. And if I'm not mistaken, just another anecdote, the Santa Cruz campus was created at least partly because the trustees were terrified of the demonstrations, some of them violent that took place at Berkeley. During, during the, is it Berkeley? During the Vietnam, Vietnam War. 
can't remember, they may have burned a building, I'm not sure, at some point. And then uh, Karen, you had a question. Comment about, I think you're raising the issue of crowds is so important. It was at about chapter 21 in book two, the, the chapter titled Echoing Footsteps, oh, that yes. I really, I really felt the pacing change dramatically. And I made a little note to myself, reading Dickens is never a passive experience. No. <laughs> because I got so I got so caught up in the imagery. He said, footsteps, footsteps, two hours, four hours living sea, force of the ocean, threatening waters, back to your comment about how vivid the imagery of water is in this novel. And I just found myself reading so fast that I had to really slow down a little bit to get the whole uh, gist of it. And that you got caught up in the whole raging crowd and this wonderful quote from page 223, every living creature there held life as of no account and was demented with a passionate readiness to sacrifice it. And nothing could be more vivid about mob mentality in my Absolutely. view. Absolutely, yeah, very good point. Um, on those footsteps, since at least I've worn sneakers for several years, and I had to remind myself that in the 18th century, many people wore, uh, hard soled heeled shoes, including gentlemen. And so someone even walking across the stones, cobblestones, possibly would make a good deal of noise. It could be echoed. Yes, absolutely. And uh, Irene, did we get you? Uh, yeah. Not yet, no. Uh, okay. Just I was following on from David, uh, just a similar story of the only time I've been involved in what I would call a, a demonstration or, you know, that could easily have become a mob was like him at university. It was in connection with the election of the rector just the week after the first week at university. And uh, I not, didn't know about it, just happened to be outside the union. Uh, and so, for, I'm not sure how this whole started, but there was a huge crowd of students there uh, demonstrating. I don't think there were two sides. I think this was a, a one-sided demo and therefore not likely to be a threat for that reason. But the police had somehow got involved by the time I got there and got involved on the fringe of this, this mob. And, uh, you know, there were things were happening like people knocking off the policemen's helmets and, and uh, mm -hmm. you know, and I could see at the time, that, you know, sort of, I, I got caught up in the mood of the time, but afterwards I thought, gosh, that could so easily have got out of hand. I wonder yes. why the police were there in the first place, because nothing would have happened if they hadn't been there. And I've always thought of that. And since then, anytime I hear of demonstrations that become violent or have, you know, problems that often it's the it, it, unless the police handle things very well, they actually can be the catalyst. So often it's Absolutely, the sending yes. in of the troops or sending in of the police mm -hmm. that turn what might be a, a peaceful event into something very different. The mob doesn't really want to be led mm -hmm. or bossed around. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I, I won't go into the full story, but the day after Kent State, 1971, I think, the central campus of the University of Wyoming was occupied by students very peacefully. The president of the university had called in the National Guard, but at the last moment, he told them to do nothing. <laughs> and so nothing happened. <laughs> Let's see, Peggy. So as I was reading this part of the book, and I had just looked at the news, I haven't been watching the news, but there are three different shootings this weekend, and there were some last weekend, and 
I'm not so sure that this is not a description of what's going on now as a precursor for something worse to come. Because there's so much upsetness and guns and it just seemed to me to fit. And then they got to the red hats and the blue hats and that sort of, um, you know, Trump with his red hat. And I just, I'm kind of worried about what's coming. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, because this is, you know, and then we've got this war out of, as far as I can see, nowhere all of a sudden we have this war with Russia going on. So I'm, I think. And I predicting. see the same pattern as in France. The Jacobin, other extremists thought they could manipulate the mob, but it turned out they couldn't. <laughs> so. Well, it just seems like it's a prediction. And I remember when we were reading Barnaby Rudge, I just, it felt like it was a prediction of the election. So. Yes, um, indeed. Yes, indeed. I don't know. Oh, so Peggy, you don't have a story of your mob experience? <laughs> oh yeah, I do. To go with David's, David's was different. I was in a mob that was, I guess he was, this was coming out of Harvard. This was coming out of MIT. And somebody wanted to make it a sanctuary for somebody who was maybe going to get drafted. So they put that kid in the student union thing. And I, oh. this was MIT filled with engineers. They had the whole, whole of Massachusetts Avenue from Harvard all the way to MIT of engineers on the roofs with um, <laughs> walkie-talkies and stuff. And the police, <laughs> however, were smart. Because what the police did was they just let us go. They didn't do anything. They waited like three or four days. We were all up 24 hours talking about everything and how great the world was going to be and what we're doing and all until they wore us out. And then they just came in and took the guy. Excellent. <laughs> I've been in lots of other protest mobs with that one, but it's, uh, I don't think protest mobs is the way to do it anymore. I'm too old. I'm glad you weren't arrested, Peggy. And, well, uh, I was Steve. almost arrested at some stuff at Stanford, but at that point <laughs> I could run. And the police. I, I have a Stanford mob story. Yeah, but the police um, would send in people to infiltrate the groups. And that's how they were doing it then and now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fomenting. Well, Nina, you had your hand, hand up. Uh, yeah, um, I don't have um, a mob story, um, oh, but I was just going to say, <laughs> it's not funny to hear everyone else's, um, but I was just going to say that um, this kind of harken, uh, this kind of reminded uh, to make like a, a modern link, you know, to um, this scenario, it reminded me of kind of the, what people call kind of like the mob storm on like Twitter and other social media things. And especially for example, how it, um, kind of like gathered so much steam, especially in like the Me Too movement. Um, mm -hmm. And I could see a lot of parallels because, you know, like it's just basically, there, there were a lot of like victims to this kind of like mob furor also, right? And I think some people were maybe like, you know, like in the aristocracy in France, you know, rightly kind of like convicted of their crimes and, and brought to justice, but other people were kind of like collateral damage, you know, which is really unfortunate. And the thing that you said about the anonymity also of the people in the mob, um, like for a lot of people who were kind of like collateral or, you know, were negatively affected by this like mob mentality, um, they don't really have like an option for like redress because it's like, who who's, there's like no one person you can like, you know, like make amends to or something like that, right? Um, and so, yeah, That's it just absolutely seemed, seemed good on either side, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, Judy, you had your hand up. I I decided that it might not be 
close enough to a D Dickens discussion because it was a mob wannabe. Um, freshman year at Stanford was in 64 and they literally took us by bus on a field trip to UC Berkeley to observe the mob. My goodness. <laughs> 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 I found it really weird. We literally were, we landed on campus and we were supposed to just look around like we were going to see something really odd, which we didn't. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Very interesting. They were trying to head you off at the pass. I so. guess, yeah. It was so <laughs> mob wannabe. <laughs> oh, David, you had your hand up. My other mob story. <laughs> This came later when I was a graduate student during the Vietnam years at Harvard, a mob uh, took over, SDS led it, a mob took over the central administration building. And ultimately the police were called in and busted them. Before the bust, the girl I later married was working on a show in one of the Harvard houses and Harvard Square was full of police. She had no sense of direction ever. So I thought, <laughs> oh dear, she's not going to be able to get home safely. So I went down <laughs> to Harvard Yard, parked my car and went round about to meet her when the show was over. And we started back through Harvard Square. And all the cops in the world were lined up and marching. And they had helmets and long, long riot sticks, not just billy clubs. And it occurred to me, we aren't in particular sympathy with the building occupation, but because of the way we look and the age we are, it's not safe to go walk on the sidewalk there and yeah. try and pass yeah. them. So we dodged around through various university backyards and ways I knew to get around Harvard and get back to my car. I'm no expert, but I think some police behavior uh, is a horizontal or disciplinary that they want to, you know, live up to the whatever their comrades are doing. And also, that's difficult to. Some to real class with. feeling that these were a bunch of spoiled rich kids who were, yes. had a great opportunity and were abusing it. And so there was real zeal with which they used those clubs. Yes, indeed. I've thought ever since that at least one member of the Supreme Court should be someone who had been in a situation where you know, had legitimately to be afraid of the people in authority. Yes. Thurgood Marshall fulfilled this role very nicely, but most of the members of the Supreme Court have led sheltered lives. At least we have one now who was a public defender at one point, and I think that's great. Okay, let's go to the next slide, Courtney. You know the story on the illustrations to tell two cities that were not included in the newspaper edition, which came out first, but they were included in the monthly installments that came out later, but it appeared that most people originally read it in the newspaper. Oops, there we go. Thanks, Courtney. So this one on the left was the frontispiece. And 
you'll recognize the little group there in Soho. Uh, Dr. Met Manette is on the left, of course, and then it appears to be Jarvis Laurie Carton standing over him. And then Darney to the right of the illustration and Lucy to, in, on the far right. And as we've seen before, the uh, Fizzins includes this big tree. So I, maybe he's commenting on the uniformity of the members or the, but the domestic scene here is interesting because it occurs fairly early in the novel. In other novels like Oliver Twist and uh, let's see our mutual friend, the domestic scene is near the end or David Copperfield too. The peaceful family is a way of winding things up. But in this case, the scene occurs early. Dickens compares Lucy to a spinster winding the golden thread. And of course we know uh, Fizz is excellent. Manette is not entirely crazy about Darnie. <laughs> Assuming this took place after uh, Lucy's marriage. But even earlier on rereading the novel, the narrator comments that Dr. Manette looks at Darnie and becomes uneasy. Anyone, well, I guess, yeah, we know by the end of the novel why that might be. But I was amazed at the subtlety here that uh, Manette sees something in Darnie he doesn't like. <laughs> then on the right, we have the wine shop, which is from much later, uh, that's in chapter six. Well, actually the golden thread could be much earlier since it's front of Runnis piece it isn't dated, mm -hmm. but this is chapter six on the right. And we have uh, Barsad informing Madame Defarge of Lucy's marriage and Ernest is doing a nice job back there with the glasses. Uh, Madame Defarge is supposed to be knitting, except that if you knit, you know that you never hold your, your needles that way. <laughs> <laughs> so. Evangelization. Anyone want to comment on the happy family here that eventually is broken up? Yes, before we go any further, I wanted to say that this central section, third of the novel, is really divided between the domestic circle that we see on the left. And then of course, the great events in the French Revolution, which you mentioned, really speed things up a good deal. So we can go to another slide, I guess, Courtney. Um, Irene, I have to. Oh, I'm sorry. Up. Yes, yeah. Uh, just uh, you know, sort of. Well, I was going to You're say I, I see open. the, I see the one on the left as yeah. as a very good frontispiece because these are the five key characters in the whole novel, around Absolutely. which everything on the or certainly on the English side, you know, sort of of it. They are the kind, and I see this as reflecting very much on book one, 
and on the result of the trial, because you're expect you're intended to see the similarity in the faces of Darnie and uh, 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 and of uh, Everymond of. Uh, uh, yes. you know, uh, Darnie and, sorry, I'm getting my name muddled up. But anyway, you're supposed to see the similarity between them that was ena enabled them to solve the court case and you know, get to mark, get Darnie off. You know. mm -hmm. That uh, otherwise, so I, I think that you know, yes. makes sense to have that as the frontispiece and that to be the beginning of the novel. Uh, yes, it's a very, uh, they're happy, but it's a, Tenuous happiness, shall we say? Uh, of course, I won't give away too much if I say that Darnie probably probably looks like his father and uncle. <laughs> <laughs> and I tell you a story about one of many nights when I was introduced to the parents of my uh, students, and. I always enjoyed noticing how often a boy could look like both his father and his mother. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember that the day after this particular event, I commented to one of the boys, I said to him, you look just like your father. And he said, well, that's interesting because I'm adopted. <laughs> <laughs> So I didn't say anything more <laughs> about that particular situation. <laughs> I meant to say the other reason I see this as being the one on the left as being typical of the of the beginning of the novel is that if I remember correctly, Car uh, Sydney hardly ever visits after he has his little tete a tete with uh, um, Lucy. After that, True. he rarely visits the house. He's still you know involved, but. I doubt yeah. if you would have a scene like that uh, later on in the novel where both of them are there at the same time. That's, that's very interesting. Oh, okay, let's try another slide, Courtney. Let's miss somebody. We have Barbara and Phyllis with questions. Oh, sorry. Raise hands. Oh, sorry. Oh, Barbara? What strikes me about this picture on the left is the, uh, you know, it, it's the circular image, the mm -hmm. tree and how they're sitting. Uh, but the tree is so unsymmetrical. And um, I'm not certain what I make out of that, but I think it's quite intentional. Uh, one thing uh, that I do make out of it is that the heavier boughs are on the, the side of the younger people, but it is kind of nice round imagery. Yes, good composition. Of course, Viz is working within the romantic tradition where nature is beneficial, stabilizing. So I suspect there's a little of that here. When we, when we studied Romanticism, I would point out to students, the huge area of Manhattan, which is taken up by Central Park and landscape by Olmsted. But one reason for that was the strong belief that without nature, some natural uh, scenes, people could go crazy. <laughs> so it's a form of mental health. And uh, Phyllis, I'm sorry, I missed you. Um, well, this is back to the uh, uh, Carton and Darnay um, looking alike. And then your comment about mm -hmm. uh, uh, Darnay looking like his uh, father and uncle. And maybe this was mentioned uh, last month, but I thought it's also interesting that Darnay's father and uncle were twin brothers, and um, yeah. and the twinness, in a funny way, goes back to what you introduced last month about that whole idea of resurrection and uh, new life, um, and that's we're getting little rumbles of that in this section as well. Um, you, I think you mentioned about the inheritance laws in France and 
and Darnay says to his uncle, you know, my twin father, your, your, your twin, my father, maybe you would want me to go away to prison. Um, so in a way, resurrection is freedom releasing from prison, but it also may be freedom and getting released from a family that's imprisoning you. Very good. That discussion between Charles and his uncle is quite remarkable. I reread that looking for any evidence about inheritance. And Charles does mention that his father was co-inheritor yes. of the estate. Yes. So that means that possibly Darney would have a claim right. on half the estate. And, and to go again on that idea of being liberated from the family you were born into, when Darney goes to England, his name is not the name he was born to, and he does not tell his wife who he really is. Um, and so he cr creates a new self uh, in this domestic scene. And Dr. Manette is lugubrious uh, responding to Darnay mm -hmm. when he starts to put his pitch to marry Lucy. And that's a big ticking time bomb in my mind that early in the book, Lugubrious Manette about Darnay. So, um, and I guess Manette himself has a new identity now that he's out of prison. I'm not sure if it goes that far. And we're just talking uh, with my friend about young people who dif have difficulty launching, getting out into life after, after college. And I said just offhandedly, wow, was, at least after high school, you couldn't have paid me enough money to go home, <laughs> live at home. Of course, I had a great home, but I'd been there, done that. <laughs> Let's see. Yes. Okay. I guess another slide, Courtney. I wanted to get into the early days and the idealistic phase of the revolution. And the left is the oath of the triplet brothers to fight to the death to defend Rome. And this is by David. And I've seen the original in the Louvre and it is quite intimidating. It's uh, life-size or slightly more than life-size. But of course, notice the wives over there on the right. <laughs> well, remember that the sister of the Haratii was engaged to one of the Kuriatii. Very good, thank you very much, yes. Yes, so you, you almost have a, a Manette Darney conflict going there. And then in the lower right, I have the uh, tennis court oath of July 20th, 1789. And I'm sure you know the history, Louis XVI, desperate to get out of France's financial deficit, called the meeting of the States General. And there was a lot of dickering over uh, voting so that you had Oh, I'm trying to remember something like 100,000 in the first estate and 200,000 people represented by the second estate. My figures are, those are just what I'm remembering. You had something like over 2 million represented in the third estate. <laughs> so the de deputies in the third estate wanted to have at least 
two votes as the third estate. And for a while that seemed the way it would be. And then for some reason that decision was reversed and the third estate here outraged by having one vote because they could be easily outvoted by the first and second states. And they're, they're pledging here not to disband until they'd drawn up a constitution for France. And so that really starts the early peaceful, relatively peaceful <laughs> constitutional phase. And someone has pointed out the similarity in the gestures here, especially the, the man on the right is probably not accidental. So I just concluded the rather bad image below because two years earlier, Louis had called an assembly of notables and this was powerful, important men from all three estates. And at least one historian, Simon Shama, has argued vehemently that the assembly of nobles almost did it. They almost managed to reform the system. And if they had, there might've been no revolution. But somehow they're, the reformers lost out to the, those who didn't want to give up privileges. Let's see. Okay, I guess we can go to another slide, Courtney. I found an image of the nearly new Bastille. It was built partly for protection against the English in the late 14th century. And uh, maybe this is a cheap trick, but the lower image popped up on the internet, so I couldn't resist it. <laughs> Peggy, this goes to your earlier point, I think. Would someone like to read for us the depiction of the mob at the Bastille? It's in chapter 21. And two, four six pages, echoing footsteps. Oh, six or seven pages. Apparently there were only 663 people in the mob that uh, took the Bastille and they freed seven prisoners. I want to add that the Bastille had a strong literary reputation, reputation from so-called factual accounts by prisoners who had gotten free. Or, and we don't know how much of these accounts were exaggerated or simply made up, but the reputation of the fortress as being a place of torture was probably untrue. The Marquis de Sade at one point was in prison there. I'm not sure why anymore, but he brought his own wide cellar, servants and furniture. So he, he was not being tortured in the least. But the crowd scene 
I guess it's about seven pages in the chapter 21. Would you like me to start reading it and then someone else could take over? That would be wonderful. Thank you. Headlong, mad and dangerous footsteps to force their way into anybody's life. Footsteps not easily made clean again if one stained red. And footsteps raging in San Antoine far, far off as a little circle sat in the dark London window. San Antoine had been that morning a vast dusky mass of scarecrows heaving to and fro with frequent gleams of light above the billowy heads where steel blades and bayonets shone in the sun. A tremendous roar arose from the throat of San Antoine and a forest of naked arms struggled in the air like shriveled branches of trees in a winter wind all the fingers convulsively clutching at every weapon or semblance of a weapon that was thrown up from the depths below, no matter how far off. Who gave them out, whence they last came, where they began, through what agency they crookedly quivered and jerked, scores at a time over the heads of the crowd, like a kind of lightning, no eye in the throng could have told. But muskets were being distributed, so were cartridges, powder and ball, Bars of iron and wood, knives, axes, pikes, every weapon that distracted ingenuity could discover or devise. People who could lay hold of nothing else set themselves with bleeding hands to force stones and bricks out of their places and walls. Every pulse and heart in San Antoine was on high fever strain and at high fever heat. Every living creature there held life as of no account and was demented with a passionate readiness to sacrifice it. As a whirlpool of boiling waters as a centre point, so all this raging circled around Defarge's wine shop, and every human drop in the cauldron had a tendency to be sucked towards the vortex where Defarge himself, already begrimed with gunpowder and sweat, issued orders, issued arms, thrust this man back, dragged this man forward, disarmed one to arm another, laboured and strove in the thickest of the uproar. Keep near to me, Jack Three, cried Defarge. And do you, Jack One and Two, separate, put yourselves at the head of as many of these patriots as you can. Where is my wife? Eh, well, here you see me, said Madame, composed as ever, but not knitting today. Madame's resolute right hand was occupied with an axe in place of the usual softer implements, and in her girdle were a pistol and a cruel knife. If you go, my wife. I go, said Madame, with you at present. You shall see me at the head of women by and by. Come then, cried Defarge in a resounding voice. Patriots and friends, we are ready for the Bastille. Oh, that sounded as if all the breath in France had been shaped into the detested word. The living sea rose wave on wave, depth on depth, and overflowed the city to that point. Alarm bells ringing, drums beating, the sea raging and thundering on its new beach, the attack begun. Deep ditches, double drawbridge, massive stone walls, eight great towers, cannon, muskets, fire and smoke. Through the fire and through the smoke, in the fire and in the smoke, for the sea cast him up against a cannon, and on the instant he became a cannoneer. The farge of the wine shop worked like a manful soldier, two fierce hours. Deep ditch, single drawbridge, massive stone walls, eight great towers, cannon, muskets, fire and smoke. One drawbridge down. Work, comrades, all oh, work. Work, Jack one, Jack two, Jack one thousand, Jack two thousand, Jack five and twenty thousand. In the name of all the angels or the devils which you prefer, work. Thus Defarge of the wine shop, still at his gun, which had long grown hot. To me, women, cried Madam, his wife. What, we can kill as well as the men when the place is taken. And to her with a shrill, thirsty cry, Trooping women variously armed, but all armed alike in hunger and revenge. I think maybe somebody else would like to take over. <laughs> okay, another volunteer. Just down to where the prisoners, exclamation mark. Thank you very much. It's great reading. I'll finish it if there's no other volunteers. I just thought I should give someone else a chance. I don't see a hand anyway. You're doing a great job. Okay. 
Cannon, muskets, fire and smoke, but still the deep ditch, the single drawbridge, the massive stone walls and the eight great towers. Slight displacements of the raging sea made by the falling wounded, flashing weapons, blazing torches, smoking wagon loads of wet straw, hard work at neighboring barricades in all directions, shrieks, volleys, execrations, bravery without stint, boom, smash and rattle, and the furious sounding of the living sea, but still the deep ditch and the single drawbridge and the massive stone walls and the eight great towers, and still Defarge of the wine shop at his gun, grown doubly hot by the service of four fierce hours flag from within the fortress and a parley. This dimly perceptible through the raging storm, nothing audible in it. Suddenly the sea rose immeasurably wider and higher and swept the fires of the wine shop over the lower drawbridge, past the massive stone outer walls, in among the eight great towers surrendered. Resistless was the force of the ocean bearing him on, that even to draw his breath or turn his head was as impracticable as if he had been struggling in the surf of the South Sea until he was landed in the outer courtyard of the Bastille. There against an angle of a wall, he made a struggle to look about him. Jacques Three was nearly at his side. Madame Defarge, still heading some of her women, was visible in the inner distance and her knife was in her hand. Everywhere was tumult, exultation, deafening and maniacal bewilderment, astounding noise yet furious yum show, the prisoners. <laughs> That's great, thank you. That's a very good reading, thank you. And of course, this passage shows the metaphor and repetition uh, and the, of course, the ocean image. But it's fascinating to me how Dickens develops the water here. We no longer have the village fountain. <laughs> so what do you think is the effect here of this ocean image, rising seas? Mm -hmm. Like, what is the uh, what? In the Go ahead. I'm sorry. Ineluctable. Yeah, Dorothy, right? Yes. Inevitable, you said. No, ineluctable. Unable. Oh, ineluctable. To be quenched. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very good. I used to ask students to comment on something in the passage that a movie really couldn't do. And if you've tried to show the rushing ocean as a, a crosscut in the movie, it might come, come, come off as comical. But Dickens can use the metaphor over and over and get an emotional effect on us, I think, that I guess you might call poetic, if anything. I didn't want to belabor the point, but Peggy brought this up, the assault on the Capitol. Uh, January 6th, 2021, does bear some resemblance <laughs> to, uh, it's largely a symbolic place, but still uh, makes an impression on people. And I was, I made an error in the last meeting about the Women's March on Versailles. Uh, it occurred, I think, after the fall of the Bastille. Um, I think it was like 
September 5th, after, of course, the fall of the Bastille. Uh, so the women had the inspiration of this day. If you call it that, I guess. Okay, Courtney, I guess we can go to another slide. Well, of course, someone recognizes that image on the left. No one's been there. It's built more. Is that Chimoso? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> built more. With the I remember the staircases. The yes which are modeled on i think an actual french chateau i can't remember anymore but i think that that spiral exterior staircase was was a copy reproduction of something on a, a french chateau yes i thought this might be a good time to look at another descriptive passage. The staircase was designed so that people going up could not see people coming down. Oh, great, I didn't know that. <laughs> uh, it is a beautiful place and I commented to guests, this is the only place I know that really holds up to the great European palaces. Of course, it was built with, by Vanderbilt. And uh, But I thought this would be a good place to look at another descriptive passage. This is uh, chapter nine. And this is uh, Charles approaching the uh, Ch Chateau saint evremont to visit his uncle. Any volunteers to read just the first paragraph? Okay, first paragraph in chapter nine. It was a heavy mass of building, that chateau of Monsieur the Marquis, with a large stone courtyard before it, and two stone sweeps of staircase meeting in a stone terrace before the principal door. A stony business altogether, with heavy stone balustrades and stone urns and stone flowers and stone faces of men and stone heads of lions in all directions, as if the Gorgon's head had surveyed it when it was finished two centuries ago. A 
kind of heavy handed, I think, but effectual. <laughs> And as with the water image in the fall of the Bastille, the ocean, what effect does Dickens seem to be attempting with this anaphora? <laughs> stone, stone, stone. The unchanging. <laughs> okay. Political. <laughs> Good. stasis yeah. that you know it's set in stone this is just the way things are the reformation mm -hmm. is yes not feasible in the minds of the marquee for certain hmm. <laughs> yeah that's one thing i brought up the assembly of notables that finally could not agree on any reforms Well, dare I say that uh, assembly of men deciding yes. what women should do, too. <laughs> yes, I agree thoroughly. <laughs> I think it anticipates the stony heart of Monsieur Rivermont. Oh, yes, very much so. This is right shortly after. Uh, the, he's run over, over the child, of course. And I wanted to pause. Uh, you mentioned the three time sequences. The fastest is the uh, depiction of history by events. Is that right? Phyllis has, has left the, the meeting. Oh, she she's had left. A, yeah, she had to leave. Um, okay, I, that's fine. I, no, I, think I, I was said. actually the one. I was actually the one that said oh. that, and you're oh, spot okay. on, Wayne. You're correct. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, the sequence after the child is run over, uh, then the, there's a long discussion, somewhat lengthy discussion between Charles and his uncle, where we learn more about Charles, but little known to. The Marquis Gaspard has managed to make it out to the estate. Remember, he holds on to the bottom of the carriage all the way from Paris. <laughs> and I don't know if you've seen old westerns or maybe just the first episode of Raiders of the Lost Ark. You'll see the hero holding on to the bottom of the carriage or stagecoach to pursue the bad guys. <laughs> and I don't know, but I sometimes wonder if that whole trick was inspired by A Tale of Two Cities. But it's hard to prove, but uh, we know that Eisenstein, for one, wrote an article about the influence of Dickens on cinema and on his filmmaking particularly. But then you know what happens subsequently and we'll, we'll get to that. While they're talking, uh, Charles and his uncle, uh, I think the uncle sees a shadow on the window. And eventually, of course, at the end of this chapter nine, there was one stone face too many up at the chateau. The Gorgon had surveyed the building again in the night and had added the one stone face wanting stone face for which it had waited through about 200 years. It lay back on the pillow of Monsieur Le Marquis. It was like a fine mask, suddenly startled, made angry and petrified, driven home into the heart of the stone figure attached to it. Was a knife 
Round its hilt was a frill of paper on which was scrawled, I'm sure in French, but drive him fast to his tomb. This from Jacques. <laughs> <laughs> but then I think Jacques one of the Jacques reports to the Defarges that uh, Gaspard was soon taken captive and uh, Does anyone remember what happens to Gaspard, who is put in a cage? But even here, I think Dickens gets a lot of significance. This is where another, he's hanged above the, the, the pond, the village pond. Yes, another fountain, which is where people get their drinking water, of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Gaspard's cage is uh, hung above the village fountain. And the, there's more great description where the decaying corpse pollutes the fountain and throws a long shadow over the countryside. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it was, I think it's a great sequence of adventure and retribution. But here I mentioned that I, I kind of get into some of the stupid things revolutionaries can do. Probably was not wise to behead Louis the Sixteenth and Marie Antoinette. If I am not mistaken, a lot of the neighboring countries really didn't pay much attention to the French Revolution until they executed the king and queen. And that brought in some serious threats. Let's see, uh, Dickens does not attempt to describe those executions. Anyone want to weigh in on why he leaves that out completely? Well, you know, if you take uh, oh, Hardy, for instance, who seemed to love to mm -hmm. write about executions and was very uh, morbidly interested in them, that's mm -hmm. That's not where Dickens' interest is. He's uh, he's not. Um, I, he's not interested in in that. It's this is about people and about things uh, happening, not things ending. Good and. Yes, and he doesn't want to uh, lard up his novel with details and uh, footnotes. Well, and as we, as we know, what happens when you do that is then we have a momentary feeling about the victims. Yes, but the the overall effect is slight. Yes, very good. And he's yes. not going for a slight effect in yes. any of his books. Really. I'm trying to find a passage in which an earlier uh, execution is described when it's really gruesome. They tear off an arm, they burn it. Does anybody remember where that is? The execution of Damien. Oh, David's, go ahead. Oh, it is on page, Damien. it's 162 in my book. It's chapter 20, uh, chapter 15. 
One old man says at the fountain that his right hand armed with a knife will be burnt off before his face, that into wounds which will be made in his arms, his breast and his legs, there will be poured boiling oil, melted lead, hot resin, wax and sulfur. Finally, that he will be torn limb from limb by four strong horses. Thank you, that's great. Uh, that's an example of sovereign power. Make the punishment so horrible that so certainly no one would, uh, would put himself or herself in danger of being punished that way. <laughs> but it turns out to be of limited significance that people still murdered. And, Does anyone recognize the photo on the lower right? Is it the Russian <laughs> uh, czar, his family? Yes. Yeah. Czar Nicholas. And son and daughters, Queen, I think she's there. And their dolls. Yeah. Yeah. They have beautiful, big German dolls. Interesting, they're German. <laughs> uh, but of course, you know what happened to them. You're shot. Uh, Anastasia. Supposedly, there were women who claimed to be Anastasia, mm -hmm. having survived what happened. But <laughs> I don't know if they ever proved one way or the other whether this the claimant was really Anastasia. No, mm -hmm. no. But do I have the date right? Nineteen nineteen, the Bolsheviks assassinated the entire family possibly or not, Anastasia included. Uh, going back to your question about why Dickens wouldn't mention the absolute um, deaths of real characters, I think yes. I would agree with Barbara in that, um, you know, she said, uh, Dickens reflects humanity in its plurality. Um, I don't think he would ever speak with that distinctive a voice about specific characters. He combines um, lots of different fragments of humanity, I think, into his characters and largely is showing the inhuman world, um, I think. So um, it makes sense that he wouldn't be that literal. I think he's doing these composites uh, of abstraction with individuals acting and speaking, but always reflecting more of humanity, I think, in, in its plurality, good and bad. And just to add to that, it's very good. Uh, in Reflections on the French Revolution, Edmund Burke had sort of made a martyr out of Marie Antoinette. And I think Dickens didn't want to try to tap into that or try to rival it in any way. But can you see Louis's head? This is Louis, Louis's execution being held up for the crowd to admire. There's also the just, point, sorry. I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say there's also the point that uh, yeah, but certainly by the end of book two, the king and queen are still alive. Yes, thank you. Yeah. I think also that uh, Dickens is taking a rather Tolstoy-like view of history. The famous names are just the froth wave. Louis. Good he, point, he, yes. Louis has got the guy, the fat guy and the beautiful queen is Marie Antoinette. 
but that they are not, they don't really figure as a force here. I only want an anecdote about the royal family. While they were still in the prison called the Temple in Paris, someone had dinner with them. Uh, Louis, Marie, and the two children. And this may have been an English traveler, I'm not sure. But he was struck by just what a natural family they were, very close and very devout. Louis, of course, was very devout. But that's that's something that Dickens would possibly have depicted had he had you know, space or times. I think we're about on the last slide, Courtney. I'm sorry about the typos here. Uh, a little sarcastically. Marie Antoinette here is dressed in white and allegedly she apologized when she stepped on the feet of one of the executioners. I don't know why this went viral, so to speak, but that was, depending on your position, either an example of great nobility or great silliness. And I included Lavoisier, this is a statue from the Pantheon in Paris, but it's always kind of unsettling to learn that the great chemist, I think he was the first to isolate oxygen yes. and maybe hydrogen, but this will take us back to an earlier point. He had the misfortune to be a farmer general. And if you remember the chapter entitled, uh, titled, Monsieur the Marquis in, in, in town, oh, Monseigneur in town, Monseigneur in town. And uh, Monseigneur in town has married his sister, taken her out of the convent and married her to a farmer general. That would be to bring money into the family. The farmer generals were tax collectors, as you may know, but they were widely believed to be corrupt. So at least that seems to have been the main charge against Lavoisier in uh, bringing him to the guillotine. Are you going to tell the story about his experiment? No, to... you tell it. <laughs> uh, he arranged for a friend to be stationed by the basket where his head would fall. Ooh. And oh he goodness. wanted to prove that people were still alert after mm -hmm. being guillotined. And he arranged to blink. And I think he blinked it 13 times. My goodness. Wow. That is interesting. Yes, well, yeah, we have a maybe time for one more anecdote about Marie Antoinette. Apparently, after she'd been beheaded, her body had be, been assembled with the, with the head to be interred together. But the grave diggers found that it was time for lunch. And so they were French. So I suspect they had probably a good two hour lunch. Who comes by the site but Madame Tussaud? And I've written 
I've, I've not written, I've read this two places. So I think it may be true. And Madame Tussaud must have had some plaster of Paris handy <laughs> because she made a mold of Marie Antoinette's severed head. And it, I know plaster of Paris, it would have taken at least an hour for, for it to set up. So that became the beginning of her chamber of horrors. Uh, I was taken to the Madame Tussauds in, uh, I'm not sure that's how you say it, Tussaud, Tussaud, but the chamber of horrors, at least the one in uh, Canadian Niagara, Niagara Falls was so awful. And uh, I, I asked if someone could take me out right away because like, I was not going to make it through. <laughs> okay. I think that's our last slide, I'm not sure. And since we have some time, uh, as I did last time, I'll ask if we've missed anything that someone wants to address. Peggy? I just had a remark um, when you said that the king was very devout. Yes. See, to be devout when you've got the divine right of kings and you're the king. Absolutely, yes. Yes. Apparently, he, one reason he agreed with Marie Antoinette to try to escape and possibly then come back and overthrow the revolution is that Louis was really disturbed by the uh, revolutionary attempt to more, more or less destroy the church. I, I'm not sure, but I think there is probably a lot to that, that uh, had they not tried to make that escape, the course of the revolution would have been perhaps less violent. I was interested in your comment about Dickens' influence on cinema because yes. when we read about the and and we the marvelous reading that the lovely lady did, I was reminded of Les Mis when we were reading about the siege of the Bastille. Mm -hmm. Yes, interesting. I don't know when this book was translated into French. I'm sure it was, but help me here. Le Mis is was by Dumas, Alexandre Dumas. Hugo. Hugo, sorry, I knew I was wrong. Yeah, Victor Hugo. But I, it's quite possibly he would have read A Tale of Two Cities. I have a story about the effect of growing up as king. Fairly late in Louis XIV's life, he was listening in church to a very inspirational uh, clergyman who talked about Jesus having been born among the poor. And Louis, If this was news to him, he said, uh, why did nobody ever tell me that? <laughs> That's interesting, yes.
Well, I'd like to ask a question about Lucy Manette, who's sometimes described as a flat, feeble Dickens female. <laughs> but I think she does some interesting things in this reading that indicate that she isn't really quite all that, um, that's the word I want, um, oh, not helpless, but insipid. That's the word, insipid. Anyone want to share thoughts about Lucy Manette? <laughs> she isn't afraid to do her husband when he makes some disparaging remarks about mm -hmm. Sidney Carton yes. and convinces her husband to look upon him more kind in a more kindly fashion. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I think that's important. Yes, I I think she says something like, I don't want you just to be polite to him. I want you to really like him. <laughs> so he agrees, <laughs> says, okay, whatever. <laughs> and another question about Lucy, I brought up one piece of evidence at our last meeting and it's hard for me to believe that Carton is in love with Lucy. Anyone want to <laughs> comment with the, uh, or that they're, you know. Yeah. Yes. I know lots of people that are in love with other people that I don't know why. Yes, <laughs> good people point. fall in love yeah. with somebody. Yes. Um, uh, they don't do it for reasons. It's just sort of, a, you know, Cuban fashion. To some extent, when we fall in love, particularly when we're young, we're falling in love with our uh, our imagination of what that person is, rather than with any reality. The, yes, yes. The person is an ideal. Our fantasy. It's also not like our definition of love because there is this chapter or a big section in the sec where he describes to her what she means to him. The when, carton does. Yeah, he said like, like what you mean, is the way she gave meaning to his life, mm -hmm. just by her tenderness, by the way she looks at it. He describes it so beautifully. So this is his definition of love. It's like, like um, he, he felt a connection and he felt a deep goodness and sympathy to him. To him. Yes, I think that's the chapter title, A Fellow of No Delicacy. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, it's so beautiful. Yes. Also. And, uh, it's so beautiful. Yes. Nina has her hand up. Nina, sorry. Oh, it's okay. I just wanted to say like an answer to that question. Yeah, it seems like she's more maybe of like a muse kind of for him. Um, he, she's like an ideal or something that will like spur him to like do something more with his life, you know, <laughs> um, uh, rather than, yeah, like a one-to-one, -one, like he doesn't really know her like personally, uh, like that much, mm -hmm. um, just kind of like what he's seen on the surface. But I also wanted to just add about, um, about your comment about how, I guess some people might have been saying that Lucy is more of one of these like insipid characters or whatever and I was just thinking that I saw like a lot of parallels maybe with like little Dorrit where a lot of people think she's like really meek and and 
and timid and all this sort of stuff, but, you know, is really like the supporting force for her father, um, kind of like understanding what she can do for him and like totally devoting herself to like his preservation, having known his past and like trying to help shape his present, uh, like his future um, in a, you know, like in the backgrounds, very supporting role kind of way. But like without her, like it would not be possible. Yeah. Yeah, that's very good. I have to bring up the angel in the house concept. Has anyone heard about this? The angel in the house? <laughs> Not the mad woman in the attic. <laughs> I thought there was the, the scene of her dad going back to shoemaking. So there is the beautiful reaction of Lucy. First she panics and she doesn't know what to do. And then she walks in slowly and stays with him and he calms down. Mm -hmm. and, yes. and, uh, and then there is a scene where she, she, she went to her honeymoon and it happens when Laurie has to take care of it and he does it in a different way. So I thought it was very interesting. Yes. There's a key word she uses in her discussion with Sidney Carton. I think she says, can I have no influence? Uh -huh. So the idea was the angel in the house was a moral example to her family, she would have very little power herself, but she exerted a beneficial influence on her family. Yeah. Which presumably might at some point diffuse a little bit into the outside world, but not always. So I think that Dickens is working with that idea that, as you said, she really helps her father and to some extent Darnie. Yes, in that interview, Carton says, I can't be better. So I sometimes ask my students who recognize that Carton is what we would call a alcoholic or substance abuser. And Carton's saying, no, I can't dry out, basically. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's kind of a dark picture. I think to some extent, Carton is drawn to Darnie as his opposite in some ways, but very like him in other ways. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, I think we have to remember that um, Dickens was a, a revolutionary, but he still was a Victorian. Mm -hmm. And the Victorians were deadly afraid of, of our animalistic side. Yes. Uh, and, you know, Punch had all those articles making fun of Darwin and and uh, mm -hmm. the fear of Darwin's theories and 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 everything. So um, you know the it, the influence of the angel in the house keeping us from being wild animals. And we've all seen houses where there were wild animals, right? So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yes. But that was one of their big fears for certain. The American novels of the same period, you have the same sort of heroine. And she has been delegated by her husband. Her husband is to make the money and she's supposed to be pure and set a moral example. 
uh, then the husband can be as unscrupulous as he chooses, but his wife will take him to church on on Sundays. Yes, <laughs> it's perfect. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I've done something weird with my screen. I can't see everybody. Yeah, well, I can see some of you anyway, that's good. Well, I, between uh, Carton and Darnie, I think the relationship is very complex. That is, Darnie may be a kind of a fantasy Carton this is the way I could have been kind of thing. And uh, therefore he holds a certain uh, fascination for Carton. I think that at least that possibility helps to make the, the especially the ending of the novel work a little bit better Yes, that uh, Carton in a way dies for his better half, for the good person. Let's see, I haven't touched on anything in the central third of the novel. Let's see, so. Again, anything I've passed over that you would like to stop on? Yes, 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 sir. Thomas, right? Can you hear me? Am I yes. there? Um, I think the novel is full of doubles. And yes. we haven't really talked about that except uh, in the context of Darnay and Carton, but I think next time maybe you could use that as one of your uh, themes, looking at mm -hmm. the doubles in the novel and what purpose they serve. Yes, yes. Well. Clearly that fascinated Dickens as it shows up in more than one novel, particularly here. Dan has his hand up. Oh, so, please, I'm sorry, I haven't looked at my... Yeah, Dan. Hey, Wayne, yeah, on the concept of the double, we had a scholarly article, I guess, put on uh, originally with this text, which was a Girardian reading of Tale of Two Cities, where it does kind of a mimetic model between Carton and Darnay. Yes, um, that's right. It kind of looks at that, if anybody's familiar with his theories, where it looks at kind of, you know, almost kind of a love triangle or two doubles kind of together that, where the desire isn't really for the object that both pursue, but it becomes kind of for the other person, for the rival. And that is a really good way to see the kind of carton Darnay doppelganger in a lot of ways. It was a really yes. good article too. Yes. So I'm thankful for, for whoever kind of came up with that. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, there's another theory in literature in general, uh, especially at least in the, this period, the woman, a wife or a sister, could serve as a conduit between two men and uh, promote their relationship in an innocent way, of course. But it's, it, it's possible to see Lucy in that way, especially when she, as we've said, that she asks Darnie really to be friends with Carton. So, yeah, uh, the only comment I have on doubles at this point is that uh, they are maybe a way of rounding out a character that to present one character with all the complexities of Carton and the 
kind of Boy Scout goodness of Darnie is just too difficult or maybe impossible, but if you put them together, yes, yes. Sarah, is that right? Yes, I can't read this. Sarah? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Unmute yourself. I did I just, something weird to my screen. No, I just wanted to see the lady that quoted from the book that yeah. is like, what was the name of the book? Or maybe Courtney can send it in email. So I'll, I'll send a, a copy of that article. Um, in oh, and also the books that the other lady mentioned. Uh, it's, it's the so companion. The Oxford Handbook. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's the yeah okay. Handbook. Cool. Thank you. And David has his hand raised. Sorry, David. We haven't talked about Jerry Cruncher. Good point. And it's obvious that he's sort of the a comic parody of the recalled to life theme that like an Elizabethan plays under plot, but my questions about him would be, does he work as a character? And is there any good reason for him to be in the book? And of course there's young, young Jerry and a Garrow water, a, a Garrow waiter. Gara waiter, <laughs> the wife. Oh yeah, the wife. Only time I laughed is the time when uh, Jerry Cruncher, father, tells his wife that she's praying against him, praying against me, you know. <laughs> I think that question of comedy is important. It's hard for Dickens to develop much comedy given this historical framework. There isn't really too much that's funny about the Re French Revolution after all. <laughs> uh, the, the only suggestion I have about it is that Dickens tries to use a light and comic style to kind of leaven some of the grimness here of the of the events, personages. Sometimes, as in the description of Madame Defarge and her cruel knife. So, <laughs> but I'm just, that's just a theory I have that he realized this material could be simply too bleak. Striver also is a little mm. bit of comic relief. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> He thinks, of course, Lucy would be glad to marry him. Yeah. Lucky. <laughs> okay, well, I guess we finish it up next time. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you. Well, thank yeah. you. I appreciate it. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you. It's always good to see you. Same here. See you. Uh -huh. Good to see you.